most businesses today face two major marketing challenges. One, people are overloaded by information. We're talking about four and a half billion pieces of new content every day. And two, people have much shorter attention spans and spend only about eight seconds on anything before they jump on to the next thing. It's no wonder that companies are struggling to get their message heard. The result of poor marketing communications is that half of all new business ventures fail in their first four years, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. With this in mind, Visual Storytelling Institute co-founders Shlomi Ron and Alex Caravallo asked themselves, how can businesses connect more powerfully with audiences? Welcome to Visual Storytelling Today. This is your number one source for the latest and most effective business marketing strategies you can apply today to rise above the noise. From video and infographics to augmented and virtual reality, join us every month to meet notable visual storytellers and discover their marketing insights and stories. Here's your host, Shlomi Ron. Hi, my name is Shlomi Ron. I'm the co-founder of the Visual Storytelling Institute. Uh, we are based here in Miami, Florida. Uh, we are a, a think tank that is dedicated to educate uh, business leaders on how to articulate, visualize, and distribute their business stories. And as we all know, a business story is not a business story if you don't have really accurate and authentic reflection of your uh, target audience in terms of their ideas, problems, uh, everything that makes them tick. So that's why I'm so excited today to have uh, one of the great experts in the space of social listening, which is a fantastic uh, a research uh, approach uh, in order to uncover your target audience, uh, is specific uh, passion, interest, pain points, and so forth. So today we have uh, David Berkowitz, He's a chief strategy officer at Sysimos. Welcome to the show, David. Yeah, thanks for having me, Slami. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, so before we dig uh, deeper into your uh, specific thoughts about social listening and where it's headed, uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about uh, how do you, get, you got started in digital marketing. What was your backstory? Uh, the backstory is, quickly as I can tell it, is, uh, is that the original idea was around 2000. I, uh, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do. And, uh, and as the internet was really starting to scale, I had this thought that maybe I could get paid to write and not be a journalist. That was the <laughs> whole idea right there. And like, you know, I didn't necessarily see writing as a career. I didn't know where it would take me. Uh -huh. But uh, the internet needs a lot of content. That part I figured out, it's obvious enough. And, uh, and so along the way, you know, I started off as a technical writer at a startup. I wound up at key marketer for years, which was really formative for me as an editor. And then, uh, I then doing PR. And so it's just like, it got me exposure to anything and everything going on in the industry. And, uh, uh and then it gave me just a, a, a great entree onto the marketing side. And since then I've worked for some incredible agencies like iCross and 360i yep. and MRY and, uh, and then joined Sysmos last year. Well, that's amazing. So in essence, you started really from a creative writing perspective and we all know that writing is really the best <laughs> ammunition for a marketer to be able to communicate herself or himself. So. That's a very interesting uh, trajectory. I was actually in New York uh, early in my career too. I started at Ogilvy & Mather, their uh -huh. interactive unit, and then spent some time at iTraffic, you know, one of the early sure. media planning and buying agencies. <laughs> so yeah, no, definitely great times. So uh, when you think uh, about uh, visual storytelling, this is a question we pose to all our guests because obviously it's a, quite fairly a new discipline, you know, as you know, borrowed from the entertainment world and brought to marketers in order to help them rise above the noise. So how would you see from your perspective, what is your definition for visual storytelling? Well, 
I, I think in, in some ways visual storytelling is really very old. Yeah, uh, uh, because we, we go back to the caveman pictures. And so in a way, humans have been doing this for you know, 15, 20,000 years. And then even if we looked at, at some of the earlier forms of advertisement, like the, uh, the murals that were painted on the walls in France in the 1800s that became the first billboard. And so, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I, I think that, that, you know, especially for those who like to tell stories and that, you know, include you know, uh, most people who gravitate toward the marketing and advertising field. And then uh, uh, I, I think there, there's a real hunger and appreciation for visual storytelling. So I, I, I think the, uh, it, I mean, we've never had scale like this. And, and what we've also never had uh, in the history of mankind was billions of people with the tools to be able to distribute their own visual story. And so, so this is what I think is, is totally different today from any other time in history. Yeah, no, and actually when I did some research uh, in preparation for this uh, talk, I actually came across a, a slide share on your LinkedIn profile. You wrote something about uh, a story about the end of storytelling that I really uh -huh. liked. How, how that came about, if you can tell us a little bit. Well, well, it, it came about, fittingly enough, from a conversation I was having with my wife. And uh -huh. she was complaining about some people. They might be people I'm related to, and I don't need to go and use this as a psych, uh, psychological session right here. Um, but, uh, but she was complaining about the people, and she said, all they do is tell stories. Yeah. And I just kind of froze there. And I, and I looked at her, I'm like, wait a second, every conference I go to, the storytellers are the heroes, right? The, right. the future of storytelling, I'm on one panel after another, and it's like, yeah. like, storytelling this and that. And I'm like, wait, you're using it as a bad word? And it was amazing because it, like, it, it uh, cl clearly, I also did something I, I, I do all the time with my wife, and that I take something that she says it's about her, and I turned it into something about me. And, uh, uh, but then I, I started asking her, I'm like, about stories of brands that that she knows and 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 it was just this eye-opening thing because it, because she wasn't telling me brand stories she was telling me her own stories and and this I think encapsulates a lot of the problems in our industry where we have people whether it's marketers creating campaigns or people internally in a lot of, of these mm -hmm. creative environments who are talking at others right. uh, and and now having this opportunity to listen to others and incorporate other stories and acknowledge that uh, if you're Coca-Cola, for instance, you, you might have billions of people who don't know your story, but you might have millions and millions of people who have a Coke story, who could tell you right. about the best Coke they've ever had, right? And, you yep. know, uh, a, a, a time they were celebrating and Coke was a part of their life and they remember it. They might remember it for decades to yep. me. That's like if I, I could ever be part of a brand that has that kind of an effect on people, yeah, I mean, my gut would be to just stop trying to go and push my story down their throats and, and coax credit. They, they've actually changed their market quite a bit. Right, right. Now, that's kind of interesting. And I know that we kind of also exchanged some uh, uh, perspectives about that because I also published a blog post about uh, are you a story maker or a storyteller? And it's really our, we actually use in our framework, our first phase is story making, really when you create your business story, then you story visualize it and then you story tell it. So in my perspective is really, and this is to your point about viral communication, you know, how mess stories are passed from one person to, so it could be from a brand to a consumer, but yes, the brand is a storyteller at the, at the get go, but once, you know, the, recipients get that story and you know likes it and maybe creates his own spin to it it becomes a story maker by his own right and then he story tell it forward so i think we we both you know wear the the, the hat of storyteller and story maker by definition it's it's just our functionality of how we pass information for sure and 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 i mean for brands to have their own opportunities to scale those stories is tremendous, right? Like there are some of these brands that have always done 
well and and can just keep doing better now that like you have so many more platforms and media properties that individually can reach hundreds of millions of people, some of them billions of people, right. rather in a position to scale those stories on, on like, like they've ever been able to do before. And, and so, so that's tremendous. It's just like, yeah, uh, it's it, it just building on some of those things that have made great brands, great brands while yeah. adapting to totally new media and, and totally new ways that people are actually interacting with these kinds of companies. Exactly. Yeah. So if we start, say, kind of uh, going deeper, you know, as Simon Sinek, starting with the why. So if somebody <laughs> is listening or watching now uh, in the future this video and they want to get, you know, why they should care about social listening today, wh what would you say? I, I think the biggest opportunity for social listening is really around empathy. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's it's now when you could start understanding on a very deep and honest level what people are talking about, right? right. And uh, uh, and and a lot of it is is rough, right? You know, like yeah. it, when it compared to how agencies like an Ogilvy or an MRY would you know pitch things to clients in this beautiful little bow, you know, right. when you start getting into social listening and you see uh, how uh, uh, how people are talking uh, about brands, or just how people are using language. Yesterday, I was doing a, a, a live demo at a university, and I had to keep filtering out the searches because there was all this stuff like beyond all these curse words and beyond all these like drug yeah. references and things like that. And then you start getting into just weird things like you know, now when. Uh, so, it, like, I was having a hard time thinking of a brand that isn't political right now, or that wasn't a prop in some political conversation. So it's like, like to start first of all accepting that what you think people are saying about you know it's like actually going to be that one percent about the product features you're talking about, and it's yep. be all of this other stuff. So, so just to try to get a real sense of where you fit in the world is unbelievable, and then. As we start opening up opportunities into visual search in particular, to be able to, to understand what are the images being shared, the, you know, the really exciting thing there is that people aren't necessarily explicitly referencing the brand. Maybe it's a logo on a t-shirt. Maybe, uh, maybe there's a, a, a package of something behind me here that I'm not even thinking about right now. Yeah. But it's in the room. It's getting that exposure. I might... It, it, uh, I might not even realize I you know, bought something earlier in the day and it's right there in the frame. So this is something, especially when you get this like, like really raw, like brand isn't mentioned at all. No, no one's trying too hard to go and be an influencer or manufacturer. And you see this sometimes when you start shifting the focus to talking about topics and not just the brand themselves. So, uh, uh, so if, it, you know, if you want to hear what people are saying, about the uh, about some of the issues around climate change, for example. Yeah. Then, uh, and you might be surprised to see how brands would come and play a role in that, and some positive and some negative and things like that. But it's like, like once you start expanding your focus and the, uh, what are these real drivers and and where do brands fit in, or even in a more tangible. Uh, yeah, uh, even in a more tangible scenario where, where like, you know, you have people talking about childcare, you know, parenting, um, just doing housework, and uh, and you want to know, like, okay, what are they, what, what are they really complaining about? We have, we have a, a, a customer that's a, a paper company that does a lot of social listening to hear how people complain about a restaurant bathroom. Like, that's a big part of their job. Yeah, no, this is so fascinating. And, and I really like the, your comment about uh, social listening, uh, uh, for the most part, is a, a way to create an empathy uh, with your audience because at the end of the day, you know, you know your messages are not going to hit the mark if, they're not, if your audience cannot see themselves in your stories. Yeah. Uh, it's really like the, the basics. But we actually use in our workshops a, a, a tool called Empathy Tool. And it's really kind of breaking down. I don't know if you're familiar, but it's really 
but uh, the fact that people tend to say one thing, but they feel different. So it's really the field things say and do. And how do you actually uh, break it down into in social listening exercise when all those four quadrants not necessarily uh, align? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and it's a uh, you know it, it's a, a pretty important distinction, right? I mean, we just had yeah. I, I mean, we just had an election where a lot of people said they were going to do one thing and right. and really did another, like uh, like. This kind of thing on the macro scale exactly. can change the world and totally upend your expectations of it. And on a, you know, on a micro level, like these kinds of things happen every single day. I, I think you uh, read the book, Everybody Lies. Yep, yep. Yeah, and it's, it's all about that. It's great. Yeah, no, so that's a, a really fascinating because we know human behavior is really multifaceted. People express their opinions, you know, in a very kind of a segregated uh, manner that, you know, some stuff they reveal, some stuff they think completely the opposite. So uh, that's kind of an interesting uh, aspect of that. So w when we think about uh, social listening, obviously our audience is comprised of uh, uh, marketers and uh, digital folks that, uh, let's say, are about to get ready for a new product launch and want to do some uh, social listening. What are the common business objectives uh, marketers would use social listening for? Well, there are quite a few of them. I mean, some of it is just very cut and dry things like competitive intelligence, just trying to understand the mm -hmm. brand landscape better. Uh, it, it, in that kind of context, it often complements market research. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, so, it, so it might be used as, as even in a more as a more immediate way to gauge uh, some market research. And beyond that, though, there, there are uh, uh, sometimes it could be for sales support, right? Like, so uh, it, uh, the paper company I mentioned that's analyzing what people are saying about all these bathrooms, uh, it, like their sales team can then go into those restaurant chains and say, look, like we have this data for you. Uh, like you might not realize that this is going on. And yep. so now it could totally change. It, it makes the whole sales process far more meaningful and actionable. Uh, there are a lot of brand defense uh, mm -hmm. ways that people are using social listening. Uh, we currently right now have one major tech company that has a geofence around their CEO's house. Oh, wow. and, is, and so, any time that there are mentions within, say, a mile of this person's house, then the security team, not the marketers, are the ones who are actually paying attention <laughs> to this and can see. Now, like they're not going to be able to track everything that way, um, but anything that's public, then it minimizes surprises. Similarly, we had a uh, we had a TV network that was worried that a season finale of one of their uh, biggest shows would leak, and because they were ready for it, because they were looking not just for the show's name, but any permutation of different kind of things uh, about what the you know, pivotal moments were in that episode and, and someone was killed in the episode, so it was like an especially salient thing, that they were able to go and pinpoint, uh, it was actually a random blogger who serviced it, and they got it taken down within minutes. And oh, wow. so, uh, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Uh, but, it, uh, but a lot of it is being ready it's like uh, you're always going to have the uh, unknown unknowns but once you know uh, what there's some things you you know whether to look for then uh it, then it's like you just need to be able to start plugging this in and training people for what to look for yeah it sounds like almost like minority report right <laughs> that yeah, well, <laughs> a, a little bit of that but at, at least you know yeah. for better at for worse and, and, and generally for better for, for consumers is, is that you know, there are limits to what you can track, right? So sure. like, so Twitter's easy, uh, Instagram is so-so, uh, Facebook mm -hmm. is incredibly hard to you know, get data out of, Snapchat's impossible. So like, right. you have that slide and scale and, and any platform can be put on that scale. Uh, and, and there's sort of like, uh, 
a kind of a two-axis scale there because because one is how public the information is, and where Instagram basically falls somewhere right in the middle of that. Uh, yeah, uh, it's got a big split between private and public users, uh, but uh, uh, but there's also the aspect of how easy can you do, do they have APIs? Can you get information out of them? Can you mm. work with them? Uh, and so it's uh, so there, there are some kind of upper limits as to you know what marketers could access even if they had access to everything public. Right, right. So so it sounds like it's really, as you said, customer service is a use case. It, it, obviously, before you launch a new product or service, that could be a good uh, way to, to kind of beef up your persona building uh, of your target audience. Uh, and then you said some uh, something interesting about security and which is kind of interesting. Reputation management, I would think, is another one. And one of the things that I also kind of uh, came across uh, in, in an interview that the, the campaign team of Trump of last year, they've been using social listening a lot. And they actually was were using keywords that the base was uh, using in his speech. So when he talked, they actually heard themselves. It was their uh -huh. language. <laughs> so that's kind of interesting on the political domain. Yeah, so uh, now that we understand a little bit about the business objectives of how to use social listening, uh, what would you say, since you've been working with a lot of uh, brands, uh, what is the common challenges marketers have today? You know, the, the kind of uh, things that they still need to do a better job at uh, in social listening? Well, I, I think the the biggest challenge is ultimately going to be just making the case to do more of it and mm -hmm. to uh, and some of that is the ROI story. You know, so right. it's like like once you're in that TV network and you're in that scenario, mm -hmm. and then it's like that's it. You're going to be hooked. Right. right. Yeah. Uh, um, so uh, uh, so recently, uh, I ran a. A story on on Rick Reed over at Intel, mm -hmm. and he's been working with them. He comes more from the crisis communications background, mm -hmm. and he's been working with them for for twenty years, well before there were tools like my available, well before there was social media at scale to monitor. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, uh, uh, but like he's been building this practice before most people even have heard of social media, uh, and. Uh, so, uh, 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 but ultimately it's like, uh, yeah, so, so they've got, like, they literally wrote this book on, uh, on just how to set up a social media policy that, right. that I, anyone can find, uh, for, for most people, it's still this like, okay, it makes sense, right? You know, if you're an agency, it's nice to have this on pitches. How do you use it in a way that's going to actually increase your win rate on a pitch? You know, uh, these kinds of things. Um, if you're a brand, if you're a B2B brand, how do you sell more from it? If you're a right. B2C brand, how do you, uh, uh, like, how do you funnel this into R&D? How does it become more than just a day-to-day, -day, you know, like, you know, need to have tool for customer service reps that actually start changing the nature of the business? Like, I've basically, that, that big question of once you have one department that is sold on it, it could be marketing, could be sales, could be research, could be customer service, mm -hmm. uh, could be security, uh, then then how does it go from one department to the other? Or if you're an agency and you have it in one office, right? I have it in the Miami office, how do you get the LA office to get on board with it? And, and to like speak with the same yep. mm -hmm. the stuff. It, it, uh, or if the Miami office is working on Ford, then how do you get these LA office working on Toyota to do the You know, it's it, it really, uh, the, uh, the, those I think are the perennial challenges uh, with something like this. And what about, you know, even from, uh, you know, from day one, you know, creating the business rules and knowing how to configure it, how to ask the right questions pretty much. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and, and it's funny, like, you know, I, I have used these social 
to listening to those for so many years, and then once I got into this mode, then I, I start seeing mm -hmm. just yep. uh, how much one can do with Boolean search, yep. you know, and how big a deal this is. And it's like, like once you meet an expert in something like that, and I, I, you know, I, I've worked with uh, with a, a number of strategists, and and I see them in action. It's like, like this is amazing, right? The information that they're able to get out of this, and right. I, I, and often when I'm using our own tools, I feel like, like you know, this rookie that's just trying to keep up. But uh, uh, but you start getting a, a, a sense of it, and then and that is knowledge that uh, like for for what for once you start doing it it becomes so applicable to everything else you do. It's like you start getting the hang of it, mm -hmm. and then it, and then you start spotting things right away. You're like, okay, got to weed at that, got to target this way. And, right. and then once you realize that, say, you can geo-filter around someone's app, like, like you're just never quite the same. So, uh, and expanding best practices of that is tricky, you know, and, and we're even working on having that more intuitive within the tool itself. Uh, when, when I, is it, there were things that I saw initially that I'm like, like, like we were almost burying the lead to some degree because some of the best material we had to get people ahead of the game that you could even just like copy things right in there and start. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 like one of my favorite ways, for instance, to use a Boolean search of it that I learned about soon after I got there was, uh, was how to use it to determine where people are in the purchase process. Right. Yeah. And so the, the lie was like, uh, uh, around research and and should I get this versus I'm I'm buying this. What do you think of this versus this and uh, uh, versus I just bought this and and now have and like you would start targeting people at very specific steps along the way oh, and even if you're a, a relevant brand there, then your interactions with someone can be wildly different. So you could actually and and if there's some kind of scale around that for for you. You could really get a sense of like, oh wow, you know, in uh, you know, in November, all of a sudden we're seeing a surge in, in people who are now just starting their purchase process for something in February, and it's it's just tremendous. Yeah, now this reminds me of my days at IBM, uh -huh. where you know every major product launch we would go and kind of develop our keyword uh, search list and develop our questions for our social listening campaign uh, and that's how we were able to extract uh, this uh, pre-launch intelligence so we can craft a, a more relevant uh, messaging uh, and do something that it makes sense to the audience so yeah it's really like you know if you kind of try to uh, visualize this uh, it's like somebody that you meet for the first time and you know zero thing about him. In order for you to prepare for that meeting, you, you probably you know check him out on LinkedIn. This is like a very small scale example of how you do uh -huh. social listening and probably exactly. get to know you know his likes, his dislikes, and when you meet with him, then obviously you start throwing stuff that you came across, and the guy say, hey, this he he really understands me you know he he gets what i'm all about so you know the chemistry is easier and communication i think it's makes sense uh, uh, from that aspect uh, yeah uh though so i i also discovered you know, when when pinterest first came out mm -hmm. uh, i started looking up some of our clients uh, who were using that and i actually felt like i knew too much yeah <laughs> <laughs> you know, and now here's like the dream wedding that they're planning, and, and places that they hope yeah. to see before they die, and inspirational quotes, and like that. And I was like, I I really just stopped doing it because I'm like, this is too personal. You know? Yeah. If you're, if you're a brand, you can never have too much information about your audience, but it's like, like it's just amazing. That's why sometimes, okay, I'll do LinkedIn, and I'm not going to check out Facebook. I'm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's exactly that. I mean, it's it's amazing how much information you can get today because of our sharing economy. Everybody putting their hearts <laughs> open and kind of uh, divulging this information. So, one interesting aspect also when we talk about social listening, uh, obviously, text is a 
is really the core handles for you to, it's almost like going fishing and you know, the, the tax is your uh, easy uh, bait where you can actually pull information from, right? But obviously content today is not just text. We're talking also about images, videos. So, and this is a connection I'm trying to make. Maybe you could help me, you know, how social listening ties into visual storytelling because obviously there's a lot of visual stories that are surfacing uh, on different platforms. How can social listening take advantage of them? Yeah, well, well, this is where you get into things that are, aren't quite as off the shelf. And, and, and you know, like, I, I think this is also where all kinds of social listening are going. Mm -hmm. uh, it, uh, and, and so it could just be at the start modern room logos, but it's starting to get far more sophisticated than that. You, know, you start getting into yeah. different octave types theme things, uh, uh, food types, all, all kinds of things that are in the frame. Uh, it, uh, it's going to start reading people's emotions better than they express within them. Uh -huh. So, uh, it, yeah, so, uh, and, and ultimately it's just unlocking all new kinds of opportunities because uh, it, uh, most of the time people aren't tagging every single brand. They're not intentionally yep. referencing it. And, and, and there's all kinds of information mm -hmm. that now, uh, uh, you know, it's like uh, uh, you know, people aren't necessarily, uh, people posting pictures of their kids, they're not using keywords around parenting. Yeah. Uh, 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 and yet all of a sudden, if you want to understand what it's really like to be a parent in any scenario today, or at least some kind of manicured version of it that people like sharing, then you can get an incredibly rich perspective on that. So um, uh, this is so this I, I think we're still in the pretty early stages of like, like you know, uh, I I say of the major platforms. Pinterest is the furthest along with having a consumer application for it. So if you have the mm -hmm. Pinterest app, you can take a look at any object, anything out there that you train your camera on take a picture of it and Pinterest will try to find things that look exactly like that picture. Right. Uh, it, uh, so you can actually start doing some of that social listening uh, uh, via visual search just natively within the Pinterest app. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, their, their, their visual lens is it's tremendous. And, and even for, like some of the applications are just for shopping inspiration and, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, but I, I think there'll be far more applications for market research as well. Um, so uh, it, it's still though, like for the most part, you have to be willing to invest in something like this. You know, and, and even still, um, algorithms need a little bit more, type, well, they need a lot more help being trained on it. And then once you make the jump from images to video, yeah. uh, it, what so so some uh, some video analysis, for instance, just looks at the transcript of the video. That's yes. not going to help with the objects that are in it. Uh, right. What what's typical also is that uh, a typical video is shot, even an amateur video, is thirty frames per second, which mm -hmm. means that there's thirty times more information in a second of video oh, yeah. than is in an image. So usually there's some kind of sampling that goes on and. And, and so you can do it that way, but it's it's a really tremendous problem that I'm sure a few years from now we'll have a conversation like this and it'll all seem like all that. Right, because I think this is I'm bored this intelligence from my wife. She's a computational neuroscientist, so that's what she does. She's doing image statistics and basically try to use machine learning to understand how to really identify images that have the same statistics. So it has nothing to do with keywords. It's really try to find a cat and by searching the statistics of a cat in terms of image. <laughs> so it's a completely different ball game. And I'm sure, you know, it's, it's gonna trickle in into social listening and the ability to analyze visual data uh, with what we call, you know, unstructured data with no keywords, basically. Uh, yeah, so yeah, this is really a fascinating area. In a, but for our marketers today, you know, that are you know looking to run a campaign and uh, get some uh, pre 
pre-launch uh, intelligence. Uh, they run the campaign, they got the results. Uh, what typically, you know, are considered like common KPIs for social listening that most marketers are after? Yeah, for the most part, you, you still get into a, a lot of basic, you know, reach and frequency type metrics. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you, you can't avoid that as the, yeah. as the groundwork for everything. And uh, uh, I, I think the, the frequency area gets in, into some interesting, uh, uh, interesting realms because, for instance, you can start segmenting individuals by reach and frequency mm -hmm. and when you do that your uh, your definition of influencers change a lot of the applicants for social listening are in identifying influencers out there again could be customer service could be for more promotional marketing yeah and so if there's someone with you know you know with a million followers who who mentions a, a brand you know one time mm -hmm. versus someone with uh, 10,000 followers who mentions the brand on a daily basis and also get collectively more engagement with it, you know, then, um, you know, the which matters more. And, and, and I'm not saying there's a, even how I'm phrasing that yeah, uh, might have a, a bit of bias, but, uh, but there are plenty of scenarios where it can kind of be a toss up, uh, but you can start looking at both and then maybe even in your own outreach, right, if you're trying to have a, a more of a marketing mix and a diversified base of the kinds of people that, that you're dealing with, mm -hmm. then you uh, then you try and mix that and see what is performing best for your brand, uh, what are those attributes of people who are talking about that tend to make a difference, and maybe you can get away with a few high-reach individuals, maybe you need a, 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 a whole swarm of very low reach but specialized people, uh, and and but then you need to figure out why am I doing this in the first place? You know, yep. what are are those KPIs? Is it to get more engagement with my content? Is there going to be a sales hook? Is it you know uh, if you're a B two B marketer or or even a B two C marketer like a credit card company that might have a longer sales mm -hmm. process? Then uh, if you have something like lead gen, some hook just to get people in the door. Right. And uh, uh, all, all of this can be, it, 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 there are different ways that, that, uh, that people are going to be using it. And then you have some that are just like, you know what, we just, uh, we, we don't care about getting too deep into this. Uh -huh. if, we're, if we're Coke, we want to have a bigger number than Pepsi or, or vice versa, right? It's uh, specific uh, to a, any given marketer here. Um, but you have plenty of those who are just like, I mean, they're using it for chest stuffing, and, and hmm. they, uh, uh, add sometimes a little bit of uh, internal prodding too, and saying, like, "Hey, how come? Yeah, uh, how come it looks like the other folks are are doing so much better than we are?" And and we want to go and reprise that. Yeah, so I, I imagine you know a lot of competitive intelligence goes into this. So one brand is wants, for example, to find out how they fare compared to uh, their top three competitors on a certain topic, then obviously you can create this picture of, you know, your volume uh, of uh, discussion, conversation volume versus the, the other parts. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I was at 350i when they worked on the whole Oreo Dunkin' Dark Super yeah. Bowl suite. Yeah. And, uh, 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 and it felt like every single customer was saying after that, like, we want to do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, real-time marketing, basically, using those nuggets of uh, catchphrases, and then you can just apply it immediately. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. but they, they wanted the same success, too. Which, uh, yeah, it's like the novelty uh, effect uh, wears fairly fast, right? <laughs> yeah. Cool. So no, this is a, a great a, a kind of a work through to some of the great a, a advantages of why you should build your social listening strategy. Uh, can you give us now kind of to kind of uh, bring the point home, you know, some one or two examples of uh, social listening K 
cases uh, that you think are really effective? Uh, yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, what, one that ties into something you were talking about before in terms of just uh, trying to understand more uh, about your audience or around, say, a product launch was, uh, uh, so, so one customer of ours, Golin, Mm -hmm. uh, they, they've done some tremendous work and, uh, and they were working with McDonald's and so they used social listening to track anyone out there who had, who had publicly shared that they wished McDonald's had breakfast all day. Oh, wow. And so, uh, so when McDonald's was ready, uh, was finally ready to go at, and launch this. And then they went back to people, some of whom had brought this up years ago. Hmm. You know? uh, and they were ready with all kinds of personalized content for them. And, uh, and so just uh, it's incredible ways to go and, and surprise and recognize the audience. And, and it's just like, you know, so, uh, and I, I mean, without fail, anyone they were engaging with was just amplifying this over and over and over again. So, hmm. so they were using this you know, uh, built-in R and D that they've been collecting over time, and so, so like they were ready. Uh, and uh, and and a lot of that meant that uh, people's first exposure to the McDonald's all day breakfast menu was hearing it from others out there. It wasn't just from the news sources. It wasn't just from an ad campaign. And so, so I, I think it, you know, once you can, can start doing your homework like that and yep. involve your consumers, your customers in, in that process. And it's like, you know, if someone's taking the time to share something like that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then they are very, very open to hear more from the brand. And so, yeah, it reminds me really that uh, trend that was really hot a few years ago, those random acts of kindness. Yeah, yeah, the surprise <laughs> and delight. Exactly. So is this yeah. still, you know, do you see it still applied today in the context of social listening and on the individual level on those people that, as you said, really contribute in a, in a big way to the brand? Uh, I think not enough in, in mm -hmm. a sense that, Yep. You know, I, I, got, I think there are, are a lot of these, these quick wins that uh, might sound, it, 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 it might sound very complicated for right. uh, brands to get involved with, but it's also, it's like, uh, I, I mean, people still love this stuff. And, and a lot of the time, these are, these are the kinds of stories that people are going to spread over and over again. So it's like, right. I, 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 the, the work is just getting a bit of that infrastructure for it just to uh, go and make it happen. And then, uh, uh, so, so I think yeah, uh, we have a lot of these things that happen in cycles. You're gonna see it with real-time marketing, uh, see, see with so many aspects of what people are doing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, uh, so, so there's still, just still also, I, I think an opportunity is to just look back and see, you know, there's plenty of stuff that has worked well over the past that, like, you don't always have to move on to the next thing right away, right? That's yeah. A, a go and, and stick to a lot of what works. And, and when you get to, to a lot of these emerging social platforms and, uh, or if you're, you're new to social media marketing or social listening, you want to start just invented things from scratch and most of the time you don't have to right there's also the aspect i think of a uh, audience maturity i think you know so they already you know the sophisticated uh, users know to expect you know if they do something really outrageously positive you know the brand will notice and do something in exchange then <laughs> So I think there, there is that, you know, these up and coming influencers that uh, yeah. you know, how to leverage that. So that's kind of interesting too. Uh, yeah, so what do you think, uh, we, we kind of touched on it uh, briefly before, but uh, what do you think about uh, where social listening is headed in the future? 
uh, you know, there's emergence of the cognitive marketing systems, you know, AI, machine learning, where basically the heavy lifting of uh, configuring those business rules of your social listening programs will be done, you know, mostly automatically. And so all this exchange of kind of extracting the intelligence is going to be automated. Mm-hmm. What do you think about all where we headed right now with that? Yeah, well, I, I think that I, I'm hoping there there are some things about it that look a lot different in a couple of years from now than now, and uh, and that includes setting up those parameters in the first place. Yeah, includes getting alerts. Uh, you know, so alerts today are typically rules based, and so you know you have 10 percent more mentions today than yep. you get a notification about it. Um, but you know, but what if uh, every Wednesday morning then you have these conversations spike by 10%. You know, what if that's when people are engaging uh, mm-hmm. with your product or category? Yeah, you know, then, then you don't need an alert for that. But, uh, you know, but if that's more of a seasonal thing and that comes, it, it starts cycling in and out, uh, then you want to know if that's changing. And so, so I think there's a lot more of that intelligence that uh, requires a lot of heavy lifting on the machine learning part to understand what normal is and then what a deviation from the norm. Um, but uh, I, I think things like that are what will help turn all of this data into insights. And I think insight is an overused word when it mm-hmm. comes to you know, the whole social listening realm. Right. Um, but, uh, but I also think there are times when you do get to that insight. And so it's like, how do you make it so that you're not just stumbling on insights? How do you make it so that you're actually getting them more reliably? Yeah, and also there's a lot of data sources that not necessarily come from social, right? You know, there's a lot of third party data sources that you want to integrate. So uh, to your point, I totally see, you know, the big challenge is really, or the benefit of automation and AI is really in crunching all this data but at the end of the day, you know, you want to communicate a human authentic story that's relevant to a person at a certain stage of his life cycle, at a certain moment. So the context is also important. So mm-hmm. all these things, I think, you know, I think it's a balance between, you know, full automation and how you can still retain a sense of uh, human communication. For sure. Yeah, yeah. So just so before we close, you know, maybe now that we talked a lot about, uh, you know, the process, the objectives, uh, some examples, future, if a marketer listening to us now uh, is interested in starting their own social listening programs, what would you say like three main tips to get them started, things that they must have, must consider? Uh, so th- three main tips that they must consider. I, I, I think um, one is uh, if you're if you're just getting started, then you've got to think about how much historical data matters to you, or how much it doesn't. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, this is uh, uh, you know, so this right off the bat becomes a, a really interesting uh, question and something for markers to understand how much they need. Are they really just going to be looking at the here and now, or are they constantly go, go to look back and want to understand those trends from a year or more? Um, uh, it's a really important consideration. I, I think, uh, you know, figuring out that pipeline for who is going to be on the receiving end of this information mm-hmm. uh, it, uh, becomes really important how do you bubble this stuff in a way and, and and how can you package this in a way in terms of uh it, you know, getting say the cmo or ceo other other important people who yeah. are really on board with this trying to find out what's the information that they will really care about even mm-hmm. ask them directly uh, right. uh, uh and so make sure that there there's some of that that buy-in and, and that what you're presenting ultimately can yeah, have that kind of audience. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then uh, I, I'd say this, the other piece of it, and it goes back to a lot of this conversation, is just 
I, I have a goal and, and set like set an ambitious goal for it, right? Like set, you know, say that you make this try to work as hard for you as possible, almost to the point that you're getting someone could be your agency, could be the tech platform, could be any, anyone involved along the way that this is, you know what, this just can't be done, but here's as close as we're going to get. Like once you get that far, once someone tells you, nice idea, but this can't be done, then you mm -hmm. probably push them hard enough. Uh, and, and then you can have the conversation of like, okay, how close can we get, you know? Uh, and, and uh, but if it's just like, like if you just start asking for someone and someone's like, oh yeah, we'll run that report for you tomorrow. Like you're not pushing them hard enough. So, uh, right, right. You know, so, so, so ask tough questions and, and, uh, and then, yeah, and then you'll force others, including like ourselves, to keep adapting to really what you need and what's going to make a difference in your job. No, this is fantastic tips. You know, I really like them. So the first one is really about the time frame. Just pick up, you know, if it's it's the past and how far back, and maybe if you want to do it for the future, maybe it's a real time uh, tracking that you're interested in. So the time frame is important. And then you said also, which is a very interesting, really. Uh, about uh, who is your audience so this is falls nicely into the data storytelling <laughs> okay. how you tell your story to uh, to the person who's going to receive the report so each audience has different uh, uh, requirements and, and the last thing is definitely really make it a, an ambitious goal that's uh, nice to have because it's going to compromise uh, your program as a whole so you want to reach something really uh, aggressive, which is great. Yeah. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. So thank you so much for your time today. And before we close, uh, how viewers uh, or listeners can contact you if they have uh, more questions? I appreciate it. Well, uh, so sysmos.com so, uh, and at sysmos is great. And then I'm uh, on Twitter at the Berkowitz. Um, dberkowitz at sysmos.com. You could uh, get to my blog at serialmarketer.net. So, uh, yeah, and I, I, I welcome questions. I welcome feedback. You know, I, uh, a, a, a lot of the great uh, uh, benefits of having a conversation like this is, is that it just uh, you know, leads to new ideas and new conversations. So I look forward to hearing from anyone. Awesome. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. And uh, for the folks listening or watching, you know, this uh, recording is going to be available on our website, on our channel. We're also going to syndicate this as a, an audio podcast on iTunes, uh, Google uh, Play Music, uh, and other channels. So until next time, don't keep your big story waiting too long. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Visual Storytelling Today is recorded in Miami, Florida. The show is published exclusively by Visual Storytelling Institute. Learn more at visualstorytell.com. You can subscribe to this podcast on the iTunes Store. Until next time, don't let your big story wait to be told.